going to continue on with the seals. And we've covered the first, second, third, and fourth. So today we're going to do the fifth seal. There's the fifth seal. Recap. The first seal was dealing with the um, Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist. That was the first seal, the first horse. The second seal was dealing with that same spirit becoming a man or an office and whatever. And that's when you got into the, uh, the popes and all that type of thing and, and uh, the, the spirit of it. And the third seal was dealing with Catholicism, the rise of Catholicism and the dark horse and the dark ages and those types of things. The fourth seal, which was a pale horse, was a combination of the three previous horses combined into one. And that's when they had both, it has both control over both church and state, both church and state. Um, pale is not really a color, it's a combination of colors. You put red, white, and black together, you get pale. So that was the first four. Now the first four seals deal with beast, have a beast to say, come and see. Now we're into the fifth seal, and so this one does not. The next seals are dealing with the heavenlies. Dealing with the heavenlies. So it's transitioning now to a different, a different, a different arena. So we're going to start in Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 9 is where we're going to start. Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 9. And it says this. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And, a white, and white robes were given unto them, or give, were given, rather, unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Now, who are these people? Who are these people? These are Jewish martyrs that have been killed or died already throughout the, the persecution times and all that, and, 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 and all, those, all that different arena of time, throughout all that different segment of time. This is those people that were killed during that, period of time they were already dead they're already there and so they're saying now how long before you avenge our blood how long before you and he said not to your fellow servants he said we got a little season now this has been in our time this is a long time a thousand years a couple thousand years in our time but you got to remember in God's time there is no Years and days and months. It's just like that. Because a thousand years is as one day and one day is as a thousand years. So these are your Jewish martyrs. And they have to rest until the tribulation saints are martyred. Until the tribulation saints are martyred. So you have a lot of Jews that have been killed due to persecution and all those types of things. Everyone can come up closer. You don't have to sit that far back. We're okay. Amen. That, uh, that have been killed. Judgment must come to them. They said, let, when they crucified, they said when, they, when, they, um, when Jesus was crucified, let his blood be upon us and on our children and upon our children's children and all those types of things. 
And many, there were many Jews that were killed during the book of Acts season and time. Many Jews. Their church was under great persecution. Many were killed. Thousands were killed. And throughout, throughout the dark ages, thousands were killed. Millions have been killed. So these are martyrs, people that have martyred, that refuse to denounce Christ and all of that. And so now they're saying, how long? And he's saying, not to your fellow servants. The rest of them, they have to go through the tribulation, are martyred. So now let's go to Luke, the book of Luke, the 19th chapter. The book of Luke, the 19th chapter. The book of Luke, the 19th chapter. And this is Jesus talking here. We're going to verse 41. And when, and, when he saw, when, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. But... But now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and keep thee on every side. And shall lay, th and shall lay thee even with thy ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visit, visitation. What that's saying is, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he's looking at Jerusalem and he begins to weep. Because he's foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem. The Romans would come and conquer Jerusalem. And they would completely, literally conquer it. And, and all these types of things. And, and kill a whole bunch of people and all of this. So he was lamenting, he was crying. Saying, you, you, you don't even see your destruction is, on, is imminent. Your destruction is on its way. And the Romans would conquer the whole thing and the whole shebang. It was conquered. And they built, the Romans built, the, he said it was a trench. The Romans built, surrounded the city and they starved them out. It was very, very brutal. They starved them out. They, put, they, they couldn't nothing get in, couldn't nothing get out. And they starved them out and it was just real bad. Real, real bad. So Jesus, is, he's weeping because of the brokenness of what's happening, what's going to happen. The same thing is going to happen when the Antichrist comes. The exact same thing is going to happen when the Antichrist comes. He's going to make a deal with the Jews and then break the deal. And then come in and do what he does in the, in the holy city. Now let's go to Jeremiah and follow this up some more. Let's go to Jeremiah. Chapter 6, verse number 8. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate and a land not inhabited. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine and turn back thine hand as a grass gatherer into the basket, grape gatherer rather. Complete, again, complete and total destruction of Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed. Everything was destroyed. The Romans destroyed everything. Completely obliterated it. And then killed the people. Here the prophet Jeremiah is prophesying the same thing. What's going to happen? God has to allow this to happen because he has to allow them to reap what they have sown. They rejected the Messiah. They did not receive him and all those types of things. So God has to allow them to go through this. He has to allow them to suffer this. Amen. All right. Go, let's go to Revelation uh, 1 and 9. Revelation 1 and 9 is what we want now. Revelation 1 and 9. Amen. Revelation 1 and 9. Revelation 1 and 9. And it says this. I, John, also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Should I underline that? And companion in tribulation and in the kingdom. And 
patience of Jesus Christ was in the isles that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. They tried to kill John, I think, three different times and failed. And then they exiled him. Apostle John. They tried to kill him three times. I think one time they boiled him in oil and all that. And then they tried to poison him and all these different things. And, and he didn't die. And he got exiled. The final thing, they exiled him on a deserted island by itself to live out the rest of his days. Persecution for the gospel. Now he said, Thy, now John was, was one of the disciples. And he said, I'm your fellow servant. Anytime when they, when they stood for Christ, there was always persecution. They were persecuted. They were even persecuted by their own people, the Sanhedrin, uh, all these different, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, all of that. Worked in concert with the Romans and persecuted them. So this fifth seal, as we're going into it, initially is dealing with the Jews. Initially is dealing with the Jews. Initially. Dealing with the Jews. Now go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 now. We're going to go to verse number 9. And after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. Now we're going to a different thing now. Lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Palms were a sign of victory. In their hands, verse 10. And cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and upon the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Thirteen. And one of the elders answered, answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore... Uh, is that where I want to stop? Yeah, that's where I want to stop. So now you got two groups. You got two groups under this fifth seal. You got the Jewish martyrs, and you got the tribulation saints. Two different groups. This group, all the ones that died, doing, like I said, doing the book of Acts, persecution, dark ages, all of that. Now they're at the throne, or under the throne. Then, after the three, after the three and a half years of tribulation, You have all nations now. He said all nations. Here he didn't say that. Here he said that. Chapter 6, he didn't identify them as a separate group. He didn't, he didn't say all nations because he was talking to one kind of people. Here... He says all nations, chapter 7, of all nations, of all kindreds, of all tongues. Now he's talking to the world population. Not just the Jews anymore. These are already dead. And they're saying, how long before you avenge us? Avenge us. He said, not to your fellow servants, tribulation saints. 
the tribulation saints. Not till they are martyred. Ne neither one of these two groups are raptured people. Neither one. Because they die as martyrs. Raptured people don't die as martyrs because they don't die. They're raptured. Neither one of these two groups, all these people die as martyrs for some horrible kind of death. Then when they send the tribulation, they get their head cut off. Here, they were fed to lions. They were stoned. They were uh, chopped in pieces, um, set on fire, all kinds of stuff like that. And so this is all, this is all, they all, all these people have to die. But the ones that make the rapture, they don't die. They're translated. They're translated from a human existence to glory instantaneously. So you have two groups. So now in seven, he's transitioned now to where now he's talking about the whole world, all those folks that saved and justified and sanctified, but not Holy Ghost filled. They all died here in this three and a half year period. They all died in there. And so they, they become the tribulation saints and they go through that. That's what they all died. They, had, they were saved, they were, they, but they were, they were clean. They lived righteous lives, but they did not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They did not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This week I was looking at some material. They're, they're flirting with the idea of something called cryptocurrency. Do you all know what that means? Cryptocurrency is meaning it's electronic currency. It's electronic the Federal Reserve is on the verge of collapse by virtue of the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the inter international banks and all that. They want it to collapse because they want the dollar to be weak and to become weak where it's not usable. And that's why they're flooding the markets. The people used to say, well, I'll just buy me some gold so when things go crazy, then I, well, I just read a report this week. Now they're finding what, they're, what they did is they're finding counterfeit gold. So you're having gold bars. Every gold bar has an identification number on it. Now they're finding gold bars with the same, two and three of them with the same identical identification number. You don't, when you ha that happens, you don't know which one is real and which one is fraudulent. Now that doesn't, now watch, now this, is the, this, is the, this is the part about it that's really important. I need you to understand. They're all real gold but you don't know where this gold came from. You don't know if it's a stolen gold or where this gold, if it came from Africa, if it came from another country. So it invalidates it. It invalidates the gold where we can't use this. And the central, not the international bank, the central bank, that's what they want. They want that. They want the removal of the gold standard. America got off the gold standard under Nixon's presidency during Vietnam. Prior to that, our money was backed up by gold. President Nixon took us off the gold standard. And that's when it got into credit and all that other stuff came into play. So now the central banks, which is part of the one world order, wants to remove that. And so now they're starting the ideas of cryptocurrency. Where you won't have currency, you'll have electronic number either here or here. That is the beast system right there. I, 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 did, I watched several things on that this week. Several things. Several things. The central bank is what controls the interest rates. Well, not no, the Fed controls the interest rates. But the central bank is what controls the, the sources of the money. And now that's when Trump and all of them is arguing with that because Trump is trying to bring it back to the gold standard. But that's not going to work because they're trying to devalue the gold standard. They're removing the gold standard. So the bottom line, the whole system is designed is about to fail. And once it fails, that's exactly what the Antichrist does. He comes in at the midst of, co of collapse and says, I got a new and better way. Here's a new way. And that's where all that comes in at. Now you get into the tribulation. Now. Revelations uh, 15, please. Revelation 15. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, that's talking about the money, that's talking about the mark of the beast, that's validating, that's verifying what I just told you. 
the beast will have his own currency system. The money that we know now will cease to exist and it'll be a new currency system and it'll be backed up by his power. And if you don't take it, then you will die because you won't be able to buy or sell anything without it. Oh, uh, mark or number of his name and the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sang the song. Now notice it said they got victory over this. That's because they went through the tribulation. They were in tribulation. That's why they got victory over it. If you're raptured, you don't have victory over it because you don't go through that. You're not there when it happens. And they, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Uh, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Again, here it is again, all nations, because now they have come through all of that now. The saints have come through all of that, meaning that the, the tribulation and all, they've come through all that. They got victory over, his, over, his, over the beast, over his system, over the whole thing, and they all martyred themselves. They became martyrs. Somebody can say amen. All right. Now, now, this is very important. Everything is very important, but I know I say that redundantly. But during this time, during the three and a half years, there are two witnesses one is to the Jews the other one is to the world during this time one witness is to the Jews, because they have the Holy Spirit at that point. The other witness is to the world. Let's see who they are. Turn to Revelation 11 chapter. Revelation 11 chapter and verse number three. Actually, I'm going to start in one because one backs up some of the things we've already said. And there was given me a reed like a, unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and, altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without, yes, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given to the Gentiles because it, they get, it gets conquered again. By the Antichrist and all that. And the holy city shall they tread under the foot 40 and 2 months. That's three and a half Jewish years. Remember the Jewish calendar works on 360 day years. Not 365 day. Okay now verse 3. I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. Clothed in sackcloth. That's 1260 days. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. They are two prophets. Two prophets. They are two prophets. Now there are signs that follow these two prophets. One of the prophets is Moses and the other is Elijah. At this time they will physically be back on the earth. Both of them. Elijah did not die. He was caught up in a whirlwind. Moses did die, but God brings him back. 
And that's why I'm going I'm I'm to show you, I'm going to prove it to you a little later on as we go into this. And God brings me at this point, during this three and a half year time, both Moses and Elijah are physically, in physical body, flesh and blood, on the earth. Physically, they're here now. Not spiritually, not in the theonthony, none of that. They're actually physically on the planet. And there's a reason why they're there. There's a reason. Now he said, uh, the time of their ministry is the second half. The time of their ministry, you have 69 weeks that the Bible talks about in Daniel. But in the midst of this 69, between, before it gets to 70, each week represented seven years. So if you divide seven and a half, if you divide it, you get three and a half. Right? So the first three and a half, that was Jesus. Ministry. The second three and a half, because remember, the weeks represented seven years. Each one of those weeks represented seven years. So 483 years had already been completed. So you, now you have the 69th week, which is congruent of that last seven years. Three and a half, Jesus' ministry. The remaining three and a half, tribulation. Why do you say that, Pastor? It's simple. Because the Bible says in the midst, halfway point of seven months, of seven years, the sacrifice is taken away. Who was the sacrifice? Jesus. In the midst of the week, the middle point of that seventh week, halfway through that seven years, the sacrifice has moved out. He's taken away. Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. When Jesus was reading the prophet Elijah, uh, 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 um, Elijah, Isaiah in Luke, he stopped reading halfway. He read half of the prophecy and he stopped reading. He closed the book because that was prophetic of him halfway through the week. That last week, he, he leaves. So you still have three and a half years left. That is this period here. That's where you get into the 1260 years. Days that's left, or 42 months, Jewish months. So 1260 days, he said they'll prophesy for 1260 days or 42 months. That is this last three and a half years of the, tribu of the tribulation time. Now, let us verify this. Turn to Daniel with me, the seventh chapter. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Actually, go to, let's go to Daniel 9 first. Let's go to Daniel 9. And let's go to verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It says this. And he shall com confirm that he is the um, Antichrist. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. One week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the ovulation to what? Cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So in other words, in the midst of that last week, that last seven and a half years, in the midway point, the sacrifice is taken away. Midway point. Now who does this taken away? Now go to chapter 7. Verse 25. says this and he shall speak great words yes 
and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints. You're wondering why there's so much trouble now. Because the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. That's why. That's why there's so much difficulties now. Because the spirit of it's already here. And actually the physical Antichrist is somewhere on this planet. We just don't know who he is and God's holding him back until the church is raptured out. But he's already here too. He just can't be revealed yet. I know there's all kind of speculation out there that it's this one and that one and this one and that. I'm not going to get into all that. I'm not going to get into all that part. All I'm going to say is I know scripturally he is here, but the Bible says he cannot be revealed until the saints are raptured out of here. And the spirit of the Antichrist is definitely all over everywhere. That's why the saints are having such a hard time now. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and to think to change times and laws. Is that not what we're seeing take place now? Laws and different things being changed and all this type of stuff. The way the world is ran. To take time to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand. Until a time and times and dividing of time. There it is again. To a time and times. Time and times. Time, one times two and dividing of times halfway right there y'all got that there it is again so it says power will be given to him he'll have power to do this because the holy spirit will be removed only to the jews but he will have a nemesis while he's here on the earth the antichrist and that's the two witnesses They'll, they'll go battle back and forth. And there'll be, a, there'll be a serious thorn in his side. Be a real serious thorn. The reason why we say they're Moses and Elijah is quite simple. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to Revelation 11. Because it describes what these two witnesses are going to do. And that's how you know. You know something by the character of it. What's the characteristics of it? So back in Revelation 11... It describes what these two are going to do. Chapter 5. I mean, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 5. If, and if any man will hurt them, meaning the prophets, chapter 11, verse 5, are we there? Is everyone there? All right. Verse 5 says this. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. What prophet called fire out of heaven? Elijah. These have power to shut up the heaven in it that it rained not in those days. Who had the, what prophet shut up the heavens and it didn't rain? Elijah. In the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Who turned the water to blood? Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who called the lice, the frogs, the darkness, all that stuff? Who did that? There it is. That's why it's not Enoch. Many theologians say it's Enoch. Enoch never did any of those things. All Enoch did was prophesy. I shouldn't say all he did. What he did was prophesy. But he never did any of these things. He's describing to you right here what these two witnesses will do. Enoch never called fire out of the heavens. Enoch never turned the water to blood. Enoch never called plagues and all that. He never did any of that. He prophesied. But many, most of your theologians, modern day teachers say it's going to be Elijah and Enoch. And they say Enoch because he was translated. And then he didn't die. But the Bible never even says he's a prophet. It never even said that. And he never did any miracles. He never did any of these things. This is the description of what these two witnesses were have done and will do while they're here on the earth. Amen? All right. I'll just keep reading here. And when they have finished their, or do I want to keep reading? I'll come back to that later. Now, I want to take you to something a little different now, something you've never heard before. This is real important. One of the two prophets, there's five manifestations of his spirit, scripturally. Elijah, 
Scripturally, you'll find Elijah, the spirit of Elijah five different times in the Bible after his translation. The first one, Elijah, E-L-I-J-H, Elijah. Somebody get 1 Kings 17 and 1 for me. And somebody get 2 Kings uh, 2 and 9. This is the first time. When you got it, stand and read it. 1 Kings 17 and 1, and then somebody else gets 2 Kings 2 and 9. Seventeen and one, yes, sir. And Elijah testified to the inhabitant of Gary and said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lived before whom I stand, there shall not be draw nor rain these years, but according to thy word. So there's Elijah shutting up the heavens. Who's got Second Kings two nine? Okay, now the first one is Elijah with the J. The second one Deacon Herndon just read is Elijah with an S. He said, let me have a what? Double portion. Your first manifestation is Elijah himself. The second manifestation is the spirit of Elijah with a J on Elijah with an S. Same anointing, same spirit, but on another man. So your first manifestation is him himself. The second manifestation, you could say, is his son in the gospel. You got it? Now your third one. Somebody get Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 12. When you got it, stand and read. Luke chapter 1, verse 12, starting at verse 12. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Keep going. Go all the way down to 17. Wait, the power of who? Elias. The power of who? Elias. Thank you. There's your third manifestation. Elijah, Elisha, now John the Baptist. Same spirit of Elijah. John was the last of the New Testament, last of the Old Testament prophets. He was the conclusion of that. The last one. Now notice they're all prophets, not pastors, not evangelists, not teachers, none of that. They're all prophets. The same spirit that was on Elijah, starting here, now was on Elisha, starting there, now is on John the Baptist, who forerun for Jesus Christ. You got it? All right. Number four. Somebody say number four. All right, I need somebody to get... Malachi, uh, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Uh, 
Uh, starting in verse 5. I will do what? Uh huh. Verse six. Your fourth one is the seventh messenger to the church. I believe. By virtue of the signs that followed his life, it was William Branham, who you all hear me talk about often. He was misunderstood by, they called him a woman hater and all these other things, which was totally not true, absolutely a complete fabrication. He taught revelationally where women were supposed to be in the body of Christ. And they, misunderstood, they, they twisted it and did all kinds of stupid things. Tens of thousands of people were healed in his ministry. Blind eyes opened, deaf legs caught great mighty miracles. The angel of the Lord even appeared in front of 500 witnesses in the river in Arizona. He was being baptized in the water just like Jesus. There's 500 witnesses. And, and, and he came up out of the water and the angel spoke in the clouds and said audibly, the audible voice, 500 witnesses, this is documented, you can look it up yourself. 500 witnesses heard the audible voice say, as John the Baptist forerun uh, the, the, the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, so shall my servant. William Branham forerun the second coming of the Lord. 500 witnesses in the National Archives. There's a picture of William Branham ministering behind a pulpit similar to this. And there's a flaming sword above him. And it's an angel of the Lord. It went to the FBI. It was verified to the point where they put it in the National Archives that it was verified that with this image that this camera caught was nothing of this earth. It was not of light. It wasn't anything like that. There was nothing that, that man could have created. And everybody did. It had to be a supernatural event. A supernatural. This, that fourth manifestation. Because he said, now he said, he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. What does that mean? He'll have the apostolic, though he's a prophet, his message will be apostolic and he'll return people back to the original apostolic teaching. Not the denomination, but the teaching. Jesus, in Hebrews, the third chapter, the verse 1, Jesus was the first apostle. Then you had Peter, James, and John, and Bartholomew, and all these other people came. But Jesus was the first apostle. Peter preached the same thing Jesus preached. Paul preached the same thing Jesus preached. But Jesus was the first one. And he said he will turn the hearts of the Father. Who are the fathers? God sent men in the office of apostles. And he'll turn the hearts of the children, the people, back to that message. Before the coming of the Lord. Y'all got it? He said he'd be a, the spirit of Elias. He said, I'll send you the spirit. Not Eli, not him, but the spirit of him. That's the anointing. That's the anointing. The fifth one, somebody get, uh, get, a um, somebody get, um, the fifth one, somebody get, oh, uh, get Revelations 10 and 7 before we go to the fifth one. Somebody get Revelations 10 and 7, stand and read it quickly. Revelations 10 and 7. Before we go to number five. Mm -hmm. When he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared of his servants the prophet. The seventh angel. You have seven mission, um, 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 messengers that are mentioned in the Bible. The first one was Apostle Paul. First church age. When the first church started. In, in, at the book of Acts, when, it, when that got started. Then you, had, then you got into Arrhenius, and you get into Columbo, and you get into John and Paul Wesley, and you get into these other people. The last one was William Branham, and he said he'll make the mysteries known. What mysteries does that mean? The revelation, the mystery of the Godhead, that one. Marriage and divorce, that one. Um, the justification, sanctification, glorification, that one. 
the bride and the bridegroom, that one. He'll make all those mysteries clear. And that's exactly what the Lord did. That's called revelation. Everybody say revelation. That's exactly what he did. All right, now we're going to number five. Somebody get um, Matthew 17. Matthew 17, 1 and 3, and somebody going to get uh, Revelations. Oh, I actually read that already. I know not Matthew 17, but the, the other one that I wanted to use, I already read it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Moses and who? Elias. Elias. Now, we already read it, but in Revelations 11, 5 through 10 or 11, it talks about him again, Moses and Elijah. This time, when he had the Mount of Transfiguration, that was a preview of coming attractions. That's why it was Moses and Elijah that was with Jesus when he was transfigured. Then you read Revelations 11, which we already did. Now, there they are again. Now, but this time... When they were shown here in Matthew 17, they weren't in physical bodies then. But when they come back the second time, now they'll be in physical bodies. That's why, let's pick it up. Um, go, go to Revelation 11. And let's pick it up here. Revelations 11. We there? All right. I'm going to start in verse number 9. No, I'm going to start in verse number 8. Uh, verse 7, excuse me, I apologize. And when they shall, and when they, and when, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. True prophets. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell on the, upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. And shall send gifts one to another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. See? Verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up thither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now, this is where they actually die. But after at their death, they lay in the streets for three and a half days. And then, at the very, then God raises them back up, and so all the world can see. That's technology, internet, all that. can see everything. And they get raised and they get caught up directly in front of everybody. But now God's going to tear some hind parts apart now. He's going to have to wear them out now. But everybody will see because they rejoice. They send presents to one another. And Amazon and all that. And UPS each other package. Oh, yeah, they all dead now. And God said, oh, now. Now it's on now, baby. It's on now. And, and then they go on, they go to glory and so forth and so on. So now, so, so I'm sure some of you say, well, okay, I can, I can hear Moses. I mean, I can hear Elijah. But help me understand this thing about Moses. Let's go to Jude number nine. This, this is your five Elijahs. Before I go, Elijah, 
Say it with me. Elijah. Elisha. John the Baptist. The seventh messenger. And Elijah the second time. Those are your five Elijahs. So if you're having a conversation with somebody and they happen to mention that, you know what they're talking about. These are the five Elijahs scripturally that are mentioned the five different times. Now let's deal with Moses. Let's deal with Moses. Let's go to Jude number nine. What time do the praise team rehearsal start? Is it 11 or 11.30? Okay. That's, okay. I, I don't know why I keep thinking it starts at 11. Yeah, okay. Um, um, what did I say? Jude, right? Is that what I said? Okay. Jude. All right. Um, Jude 9. It says this, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst, which means dare, not bring an accusation against him, uh, 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 durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said the Lord rebuked thee. So now Michael the archangel and Lucifer the devil are having a dispute over Moses' body. And there's a reason for that over Moses' body. They're having a disagreement like whatever, tussle you want to, whatever you want to call it. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. And we want to go to verse number 5. says this, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. I hear pages turning. I'll wait. Are we all there? All right. I'll read it again. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him. Who buried him? God buried him. I'm in Deuteronomy 34. Verse 6. The people did not bury Moses. In fact, the people didn't even know, don't even know where he was buried. God buried him because God's going to resurrect him. Nobody knows. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Belporah. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. God himself buried him and then God hid it where nobody else will be able to find it. That's why Satan and Lucifer were contending. He said no man will be able to find it. No man. But Lucifer the devil and Michael the archangel were contending over it because Lucifer obviously he's not a man. That's a spirit. But no man, no human, because the people knew where it was, they'd go dig him up and they'd be worshiping Moses' bones. They'd make an idol out of it. God himself here, there was no burial procession and all that and some big, or you would think the leader of the entire Hebrew people, they would have a big, big hoopla. There was none of that. God deliberately didn't do it that way because he knows he has to bring him back. He knows that. So he hid him. In a place where only he, where he knows where he is, where no man knows where he is. It's just like this, ladies and gentlemen. It's just like this. The Garden of Eden is still somewhere on this earth. But God ain't going to let no person find that place. And that's why there's an angel, a, sheriff, a cherubim, standing in front of it with a swinging sword. So if anybody even come anywhere near, whack. God ain't never going to let nobody find that place. Ever. Because there's still access to the tree of life there. We've never let it. It's still here. Through the flood and all that, it's still here. It, you got to remember, that garden was here before the flood. It was here during the pre-Adamite race. That's why he said, 
That was that anointed cherub. I'm talking about Lucifer that walked in the garden of God. It was there before Adam and Eve's time. It was there during Adam and Eve's time. And it is there after Adam and Eve's time. And God said, I got to put an angel in front of this because nobody needs to go in here. They can archaeology, they can dig, they can research, they can do whatever they want to do. When God want to hide something, it's hid. Ain't nobody going to find it. Nobody. Now, you can use satellite and everything else you want to use. God is not, if you don't want it found, it ain't going to be found. Plain and simple as that. Here, God buries Moses and then he puts him in a place where no man can find him because he has to bring him back. Now, go to back to Revelations. We're going to go back to uh, not missing something here. Where did it go? Where did it go? Because I needed this. Aha, there it is. Um, let me prove something to you real quick. Matthews 9 and 24. Matthews 9 and 24. I want to show you something. Because it's not unprecedented for God to do this. Matthews 9 and 24 says this. I'm going to start in 20. I'm going to start in 21. I'm going to start in 22. But Jesus turned, turned about him, and when he saw her, no, we're going to skip down. Um, no, we're going to start in 18, and then we're going to do some skipping. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler who worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Then you get into the woman with the issue of blood. Now go down to 23. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making noise, he said unto them, Give place, for, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. Y'all having a funeral thing, because you, you, to her, she is, to you, she is dead. But to me, she ain't dead. She's just sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn, like, yeah, right, don't you realize she don't have no pulse, she's not breathing, there's no, and there was no um, um, ventilators and all that type of stuff to keep people alive, there were no machines. So they laughed him to scorn, like, yeah, right, she hasn't taken a breath in six hours. What are you talking about? She's asleep. She's dead. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose, and the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. They had pronounced her dead, had the funeral people there. In our time, that would be the, that's equivalent to somebody dying in your house. You get all your family over there. Everybody's crying ah, and all that and all this. You even get the mortuary people come with the, mort with, the, with the hearse outside and put them in the bag and get ready to put them in there. And somebody say, wait a minute, they ain't dead. And people look at them like, are you crazy? The paramedics was here two hours ago. They dead. They say, they ain't dead. You crazy. Get out of here. He said, everybody leave out of this room right now. You don't tell me. Everybody leave out this room right now. Everybody get up and leave. And that person say, in the name of Jesus, rise. And they get up. That's exactly what happened here. Exactly what happened. Rise. Mortuary people, all them people is there. The mortuary, everybody there. Caretakers, everybody there. And the Lord said, put everybody out. Put them all out. She ain't dead. Yeah, right. Put everybody out. That's one witness. Now let me give you another one. Go to Acts. Now somebody said, why don't God do that all the time? Because he's sovereign God and he does what he wants to do. That's why. This is his choice. Acts chapter 9. And we're going to start in verse 36. Now there were, now there was, excuse me, now there was at Joppa a certain damn disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Whom when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper chamber. For as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, 
and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. She was a seamstress. 40. But Peter put them all forth. He put everybody out and kneeled down and prayed. And turning to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and she saw Peter, and she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. When he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. She was dead. He was in a whole other city. They sent for him and said, we want Peter to come. She was already dead. They had washed her, put her in burial clothes, all of that. It was a wrap. It was over with. She was dead. And they sent for the man of God. He comes. Put everybody out. Now notice Jesus just gave her his hand because Jesus was God. He didn't have to pray. He's, he was God. The few times he did pray, he said, this is for you all's benefit. Not for mine, but it's for you benefit. Peter had to pray. Say, in the name of Jesus, rise. That's two precedents where people were dead and God yet brung them back. Moses will be brought back. To God's sovereignty, he will be brought back because he has to be a witness. Now, why do you need him? It's like we said a while ago. Elijah is a prophet to the world. Moses prophet to Israel. Elijah was a prophet to the world. Ahab, Jezebel, other people that weren't Hebrews. Moses was a prophet lawgiver to the Jews. Not to the rest of the world. Let's back it up. Now go to Revelations 14. Revelation 14. Now remember, these two prophets ministered for three and a half years. The Jews at this time of their ministry are the only ones that have the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles do not because we're in the tribulation. But you have folks that saved and justified, but they're being martyred. They're being martyred, they're being killed. But the Jews have the Holy Spirit. Not, but not every Jew. Not every single Jew. That doesn't mean every Jew is going to be, have the Holy Spirit. Not all of them. But he's to those who he goes to the Jews. And those who will receive him will receive him. So now the whole thing is directed at Israel at this point. And the lamb, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers and harping with their harps. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. For, uh, four. These are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among, uh, among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Uh, five. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. 
These are 144,000 Jewish evangelists. 444,000 Jewish evangelists. That's why it says there's a remnant of them. Not the whole, a remnant of them. A remnant, not the whole nation, a remnant of them. A remnant of them. Is that you saying only 144,000 Jews is going to be saved? I didn't say that. I said these are Jewish evangelists that are used to minister to the Jewish world. Now you have to think about something. You have more, the Jews that's in Israel, that's not the, all the Jews in the whole world. You got Jews in Ethiopia, you got Jews in Europe, you got Jews in Russia, you got Jews in different parts all over, you even got Jews in America, you got Jews all over the place. So it's not just the ones in Israel, the land. And I know you got the black Hebrewites and all that other type of thing and all that and, and what have you and so forth. I'm not talking about that today. But you do have Jews all over the world. All over the world. They're scattered all over the world. And then God will begin to call them home. So all of them won't be saved, that's another teaching, but their nation will be evangelized by the Holy Spirit. But all of them won't be saved, but they will, because again, they're all over. In fact, the ones that run most of Hollywood are Jewish people. The one that was um, 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 the um, Attorney General, acting Attorney General, doing the Russia thing, Rosenstein, Jewish. The guy that's uh, um, on the first take with Stephen A. Smith, Max Kellerman, Jewish. And we just, uh, 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 I, really, I really like this guy, even though he's liberal, but I, I really like him. Howard Dorseritz, Jewish. They're all in America. He was, a, he was a professor at Yale or Harvard or one of those places. I, really, I enjoy listening to him talk sometimes because he says some interesting things and what have you. And so they're, they're, these are different people that are Jews. These are in the United States. Highly educated. So there are Jews all over the world. That nation had, when I say nation, I'm not talking about a geographical space. I'm not talking about boundaries of a country. I'm talking about a people. Everybody say people. A people. That whole nation has to be evangelized. And now they have access to the Holy Spirit, so means there can be uh, salvations and Holy Spirit and all that other type of thing take place. So there'll be, you'll have the two prophets they're wreaking havoc on the world, tormenting the beast and all that. At the same time, you got evangelists that are evangelizing the Jewish world. They're getting saved. No, no, Gentiles will get saved, but Jews will, because you can't get saved unless you have the Holy Spirit, unless he's accessible. And I've taught you before, during this time, he's not accessible to the Gentiles. Y'all got it? You sure? All right, now go back to Revelations Chapter 7. This is our last scripture. And then I have time for a couple of questions if there are any. After this, we have just two more seals to go. Six and seven. Uh, what did I say? Is that what I said? Is that that's, that's what I Oh. I'm looking at the fifth. Fi <laughs> I'm looking at something else. <laughs> All right. Um, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on the tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the sea, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, hurt not the earth, the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed, everybody say sealed, sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What seals people? What seals us? Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 and 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So he's talking to Jews here. He's not talking to Gentiles. Remember this, because the Gentiles don't have access to the Holy Spirit, so they can't be sealed. Four. Now let's get into it a little bit. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. They were sealed 144,000. 
All of the tribes of the children of who? Of who? Of who? Of the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of uh, Manassas were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed, 12,000. Of the twi tribe of Ishtar were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed, 12,000. All Jews. Is that what your Bible just said? All Jews. Not Gentiles. All Jews. Elijah, prophet to the world. Moses, prophet to the Jews. At this particular juncture, they are uh, doing their thing here on the earth. And these Jewish evangelists are Jew evangelizing the Jewish nation. So under this fifth seal, under this fifth seal is when my, Moses and Elijah come back on the scene. And this fifth seal is dealing with, the, it starts in the heavenlies. The other four seals, the four horses, the white horse, red horse, black horse, pale horse, that started on the earth. We got it? We got it? All right, I'll take a question or two. I got a few minutes. I'll take a question or two on this. No, not just the Ten Commandments, the whole law. The law was 490 parts. Yes. The entire law was 490 parts. And there was all kinds of things in there about all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's when they had all the different types of sacrifices, pigeons and don't, talked about don't drink, uh, don't eat the blood of this meat and all this other kind of stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff in there. Stoning people and all those types of things and uh, lots of things. And what to do, the year of Jubilee and, and slaves and all that was in there. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. 100, 490 parts to the law. That's what these groups that, that, that all these different factions that say, we're going to follow the law, but hold it, how you, we, but we're going to follow this part and this part. You can't do that. You can't pick parts of the law you're going to follow in this one. He said, either the Bible says in James, either you follow the whole entire thing or you don't follow none of it. You don't pick and choose. I like this, but I don't like that. So I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. That's like saying, I'm going to have the Holy Spirit, and I like having love, and I like having joy, but I don't want to have forgiveness, and I don't want to have temperance. So I'm going to pick what part of the fruit of the Spirit I'm going to have in my life. You can't do that. It's one fruit. If you get the whole package or no package. No, that's why the Bible said Jesus came because they could not fulfill the law. Even the priest couldn't do it. That's why Jesus came. So because he said, I have to fulfill this law because if I don't, ain't nobody going to be saved. Everybody going to die. It was all part of God's master plan. It was all part of his master plan. And when he brought them out of Egypt, you got to look at this. When he brought those people out of Egypt, they had been in bondage for 400 plus years. They had no structure. They had no order. They had no nothing. Their minds were in bondage. That's why I said, let's go back to Egypt. What's in Egypt? Slavery and death. But let's go back to Egypt. It's better there. Their minds were messed up. They had no structure. They had no order. They, had, they, they were wild. They had nothing. So God said, I got to get some order in here. That's why if we don't have order, we got confusion. God's not the author of confusion. So if there's disorder around me, then I need to ask God, help me get some order here. Let me put this thing in order because I shouldn't have confusion all around me. Now, I'm a, I have OCD real bad, so I, I can't handle stuff scattered all around. Uh-uh, no, 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 no. We got to put this together here now because that's confusion. I need to know where my socks are, my shoes are. I need to, just, why is the spoon in the, in the, in the, in the fork drawer? And why is the, the knife in the desk drawer? Put this, where, where do we need to <laughs> <laughs> no, I ain't got nothing to do with it. That's just me. But anyways, that just enhanced what was already there. That just enhanced. Any other questions on this teaching today? This fifth seal. That was a lot of meat. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. 
Yes, ma'am. A couple clarifications. So you said that there's two groups in the Mephisto, right? The Jews and the martyrs, and then one in the tribulation group. Mm-hmm. So you said that the in that first group, the Jews were the ones that are excited to act in the dark ages and all that. Are they eligible to receive the Holy Spirit? They already did. Right. They're dead. They're yes. Saved. They're, they're, they're saved. Yeah, they're, they're, it's over. Yeah. They're already, they're already in paradise. But they, they, so their time on this earth is completed until the millennium and all that. Then um, they'll get in, then the millennium, then that comes, and that's a whole different set of teaching right there. So are they judged or they still have to be judged? No, they still have to be judged. Anybody that doesn't have the Holy Spirit has to be judged, but their, their judgment, but they're not in danger of going to hellfire judgment. Their judgment at that point is what type of reward they'll receive for their life. Now you get into 1 uh, Corinthians 15 chapter where he talks about we have uh, mansions not made with hands and all this type of thing and different scriptures where the Bible talks about the, the, the different crowns. You have a crown of righteousness. You have a soul winner's crown. You have a crown of peace. You have a crown of joy. Uh, you have a crown of light. And then he says, he starts talking about there's different jewels in each crown. Some jewels represent soul winning. Some jewels represent gifts and they represent different things. So that's when you get into that part, the rewards all the different rewards that's involved. And then each person, when they stand before God, they're rewarded according to their works. So if their works, if there's a lot of works, then there's a lot of reward. Even if there's just a few works, they still get a reward because they're in eternal life. And there's no, I don't want to make it sound like this. There's no different levels of existence in heaven where you got one group there, they're there, but they're the lower group. It's, it's all equal to this extent, the only exception is that the bride doesn't serve the altar. The bride sits at the altar and are served by Jesus. The rest of them serve the altar. But it's not service like we think, not like this kind of service on this earth. It's a different thing. It's much different because we're not in physical bodies and all that. So then we answer your question. Any other one? People that backslid and they're in the tribulation, yeah. they go to hell. They, they, they can't come back. Once, the, once, it's like this. Grace. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. So now, somebody backslides. They fall out of grace. They're no longer in grace because they're back in the world now. Now let's look at that. Real quick, I can do this really, really fast by the grace of God. Okay, let me, go to, let me go to Romans first. Go to Romans at the 11th chapter real quick. Clerkly, get where the scripture where it says dog returned to his own vomit. Get that for me. I know it's in Peter. Get that for me. Start here. I say then, Revelation, I mean Romans 11 and verse 11. I say then, have they slumbered that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come to the who? 
First 11. I'm in, I'm in Romans 11 and 11. Are you there? Romans 11 and 11. I'm going to read it again. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Rather, through their fall. He's talking to Jews now. The Jews' fall, the Jews' blindness, all that. Jews being blind. Through their fall, salvation has come to the who? Gentiles. Gentiles. For to bro provoke them to jealousy. Now if they fall, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you, Gentiles, insomuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify, uh, I magnify mine office. Um, now jump over to 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be blind, lest you, least you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel. Why did it happen to Israel? Because God had to blind them so the Gentiles could have salvation. Now look, until, everybody say until. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Once the last Gentile is saved, that's it. It's over. It's a wrap. The door is shut. Nobody else. So now all those that backslide, you got it for me? Where is it? I knew it was there. Read, can you stand and read it for me? Never mind, I got it, I got it, I got it, I get it, I get it. I get it. You said Second Peter what? Two? Got it. But after they have escaped, now look at this. For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled, see, therein and overcome, see. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. They got saved, they got out, they got delivered, but they allowed themselves to get tangled back up, wrapped back up, pulled back in there again. Uh, they're worse off. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment. And that's not the Ten Commandments. That's the word of God, the whole book. Commandment delivered unto them, but it has happened unto them. According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit. Again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. In other words, God bails us out, gets us out of the muck, the mire, the mess, the junk, the filth, the garbage of the world, and then we backslide and go back out there again. God said, you were, it's, it's worse off. Now you tie that into Romans 11 and 11, 11, 25. Once this Gentile group is full, It's over. Once that's done, it's done. There is no more. Lord save them. Lord, it's done. It's over with. It's done. Everybody that's going to be saved is already saved. Those that backslid and fell out, if they don't make it back, that's why you have this scripture here. Hebrews 6 chapter. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If, 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 if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. I mean, go to work on them quick once they backslide. Go after them quick. Quick. The scripture in Jeremiah and all that talks about uh, uh, tell, if you don't tell a backslider or a transgressor their way, the error of their way, that blood will be required on your hand. So he says, go after them quick. Plead with them. Talk with them. Pray with them. Work with them. Say, Come, whatever you got to do, work with them. You don't want to do this. I'm not listening to you. Uh, pray with them some more. Uh, until God says, stop praying. When God says stop, now they're in his hands. 
and he does what he never he needs to do at that point. So if they're backslidden, if they don't make it back, before that Gentile dispensation is full, then they'll be lost. Well, don't name no names and all that. Uh, just, just the best thing you can do is, or what any of us can do, the best thing we can do for people that do that is be a witness to them, show the love of God, and be ready to answer them whenever they call, even if it's 2 in the morning. Be ready. Because you might have to be the lifeline. You, might have, you and I might have to be the lifeline. So that's why don't put your phone on silent when you go to bed at night. Leave the room, might turn the ringer down real low because somebody might call at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, crying, talking about, I need help. Now, if they come calling you at 2 in the morning for foolishness and stupid stuff, then you just have to get, deal with that then. And look, don't, if this is, don't, don't do that to me. I got to get away and go to work. But if you have a need, call me. But don't come talking about, I want to know who, cut, who the 49ers cut at 3 o'clock in the morning and all that. That's foolishness. Answer your question? All right. We all good, everyone? Yes, ma'am. When it, you're saying that if they come back to God, that means God becomes their first love again? That means if, they, if they've forgotten, if they, if they walked away from God and now they're starting to go back to read their Bible and a little prayer and all that, that means God is dealing with their heart and they're on the way back. They're not all the way back until they're back fully in God, where they, back all the, until they're completely reinstated. But that's a very good step, that they're reading the Bible, that they're praying, that they're doing whatever, because that means God's dealing with their heart and they're letting God deal with them. So they're definitely on the right pathway. They're heading down the right road. Kind of the I'm smiling because we talked about that. When did we just talk about that, Sister Maria? Thursday night. So I think, is that message online? Yes. Go to the website or where, I, where I, go to Mr. He knows how to find it. And it'll answer that. That's a, that's a good question. And it'll help answer that, that question. And so to, um, yeah, it'll help answer that question. I'm not neglecting you, Sister Rosa, but we just went over that in kind of detail on Thursday night and so that I hope you have some understanding so because uh, I can't really do it now because it's yeah time but uh, uh, brother clerkly can you instruct her how to do that so she can find it amen give the Lord a hand praise everybody amen